Did Paul, did the Apostle Paul believe that Jesus was a pre-existent being who came down from heaven, like what we read about in John with the Logos, was co-creator, if you will, uh, comes down from heaven, puts on flesh, goes through life, you know, born of a woman, born under the law, dies, and then ascends back to the place he came from? Or do you have a different uh, take on this is the Philippians hymn, so to speak? So, Yeah, I have a different take. But remember, I'm accepting just the seven early letters of Paul. It makes a huge difference. If you go into Colossians, Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, which I think are written in the voice of Paul, but are not first person Paul, I think that represents a development that's more in the direction of the Gospel of John. But if you stay uh -huh. just with Paul, the passage we're going to begin with, Philippians 2, usually people just do, what, 5 through 10, have this mind in you, and so forth. Now, many, many New Testament scholars believe this is a pre-Pauline Christological hymn. This is kind of a category that people have invented. Um, and it may or may not be the case. I don't think there's any way to say. Uh, you know, Paul does seem capable of writing pretty poetic and finished material. For example, everyone knows, uh, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love. It's read at every wedding. And uh, of course, you could say, well, he didn't write that either. But most, you know, many would say he wrote that. So whether he wrote it or quoted it, I mean, he did one or the other or both. Uh, I think he probably wrote it, and I'll tell you why. I think it fits his theology in other places, which we'll talk about. Mainly his view of resurrection of the dead, which okay. is going to hook into this, okay? I have and, my, I'm getting my Philippian. You tell me a chapter and verse, I'm I'm going to be reading it with you. So good. I hope the audience and you know how to flip the Bible open quickly because you grew up doing that. You know, we used to play <laughs> games in church where we you know, have the, the word of God, the sword, and you name out, you know, Philippians 2, 5 through 10, and yeah. you know, everybody <laughs> turn to it, like football signals, you know. Anyway. And and book, so, the book you wrote, though, that is in the vein here, this is your Genesis translation, which is really good. I hope everybody goes, and there's a lot lost in that translation, but this Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which is based yeah. on your dissertation, just so everybody knows, like, if you want a thorough, sourced, well-documented, detailed explanation for what's going on when Paul says, you know, I once knew a man who, uh, I'm not going to brag, but, uh, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> you know, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> he went to the third heaven. This is deeply dealt with, with Dr. Tabor. And anyway, I had to just plug you cause I'm a shameless plug and you know, that's me. fine. I so, don't mind shameless plugs or shameful plugs. So either, either one. way, I'm, I'm a plug. So so, yeah, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, that book is my take on Paul's mystical ideas, but it includes his so-called Christology, that is, his views of the human Jesus and what he became and so forth. And I do cover this passage in, the, in that particular book. The other book is Paul and Jesus, mm. which is more of a trade book. It's not my dissertation. It's a popular book. It's a page turner. I think you will find oh, yes. if you like Paul. And that particular something book, that I've never heard anyone that I've read on Paul, the way you explained him, yeah. I was like, this guy's, you know, when you think of modern charismatics, he isn't just, you know, you would think a lot of modern charismatics are ignorant. He's yeah. highly like an intellectual charismatic in a weird, different way. It's really interesting. Yeah. So in, in the Paul and Jesus book, the more popular book, uh, I actually spin out of this passage with a chapter on Paul's greatest idea. The pro I'll get to Philippians, but let me just say, the problem with Pauline studies, as I understand it, and, you know, I've been teaching 45 years, so I got my PhD that long ago, uh, is that he's been seen in the Roman Catholic and Lutheran Reformed traditions primarily as what we would call judicial. That is, the idea would be that to understand Paul, his main thing is justification by grace through faith. 
Right. Like, remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace we are saved through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, so forth, Romans 3. So people think that's the heart of Paul. It's coming more from Luther and from Augustine and other church fathers that are fairly guilt-ridden and they want to be saved. They're, you've got to ask, what is your big religious question? And, and Paul's re big religious question is not, how do I get saved? Everybody thinks it is, but it isn't. Paul's big religious question is, how is it that a human being, flesh and blood, born of a woman, has been exalted into the highest heaven and become ruler of the cosmos? And what is that all about? And in other words, he has a cosmic view of salvation. We'll see in a minute as we go through this and some other passages, Paul actually would ask the question, how is God going to save the cosmos, not just take individuals out of the cosmos and put them up in heaven? That's more of a Hellenistic view, that my soul is down here, I'm trapped in a physical body, I'm in the dark lower sphere of the world, I'm a stranger in a strange land. You know, this is sort of the Gnostic view of the cosmos. Paul has a more Hebraic view that God created the world subject to futility, is the word he uses in Romans 8. In other words, it's decaying. We have rotten flesh and blood bodies. We're subject to death because of Adam, the first Adam. I don't mean original sin. I mean, we are, according to him, descendants of that first man of dust. He's made dust of the earth. He goes back to the dust. So his question is, how could a man of the dust, an Adam, you know, who's going to breathe his last and go back to the dust, become the cosmic ruler of the world. Now, the view you quoted in the early part would be John. Well, because he always had that in the beginning. Glorify me, Father, with the glory I had from you from what, before the world began. So what people do is they go to Colossians, a later letter. I mean, let's face it, if, if, if the scholars are right, a forgery, right? It, it, not written by Paul, maybe with some Pauline ideas, but it's really altered. Or they go to Colossians and they get that pre-existence. Mm. Then they go to Philippians 2. And I know a lot of the mythers, people that wonder if Jesus even existed, they love this passage because it seems to give a kind of a pre-Pauline myth of the pattern of Jesus. So he's not really a person as much as of an idea. I think Paul believed that Jesus was a man of dust. He was flesh and blood. And that when he died, he died like anyone else. But then he believed something happened. And it's actually not resurrection. That's the wrong word, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I don't think you're not going to see. I don't want to You're not going to see resurrection in this passage. Like okay. it should. Let's let's just read it. Okay, have this mind in in yourselves. This is RSV, uh, which we're, is we're, we're, chapter two, right? Chapter two, verse five. Okay. Who, though he was in the form of God, I understand why people misunderstand this. You know, because I'm just going to read it first, and everybody, you know how you have an idea in your head, you go, yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard that. Well, wait a minute. Let's. We're going to go back. Though he was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to it and take it, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant or literally a doulos, a slave, the lowest form, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has raised him from the dead. I'm misreading. Does it say? Highly and therefore, exalted. Highly exalted him. We just skipped the resurrection. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is Lord, kurios. He's Lord of the cosmos to the glory of God the Father. So there's God the Father, the cosmic Lord Jesus, and then flesh and blood human beings. Now, 
here's my reading of that. I've got my Greek New Testament if we need to go into the words. I think he's actually giving a parody or an example of two atoms, A-D-A-M-S, okay? There's Adam one, Garden of Eden, who was told by the Nakash, I'm not going to call him Satan, that's a much later development. Uh, right. Nakash means the slick one, the shining one. Uh, he's sly. He's, he, we even use that in English. You go, eh, he's a pretty slick operator. You better be careful. It's the same <laughs> idea. It says he's subtle, the old King James. He's slick. He's subtle. Watch out. Uh, Nakash is like brass. It's shiny. You know, he's slippery. Okay? Yeah. So the slippery one says to Adam and Eve in the full story, uh, what about that tree? In the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. I'm going to call it good and bad. That's a better translation than good and evil. Evil is a different word. Just good, bad, opposite. Okay. And the Nakash says to him, uh, you know, you should eat that because first of all, you're not going to die if you eat it. And secondly, you'll be like God. You're going to become like the Elohim. Mm-hmm. So why don't you, listen, grasp the fruit, grasp it, eat it, and you'll become equal with God. Okay, now that's in the, first. in the Septuagint, it's the same concept, right? There's this idea of grasping. That's right. Okay. Because we right. know Paul's version would be your Septuagint, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's Adam 1. So what happened? He thought, man, we'll be equal to God. I'm going to grasp that equality and take it. And he ended up, dust you are, and to dust you will return. And he didn't get to eat the tree of life. He was forbidden and kicked out of the garden. This is the metaphorical way I would read Genesis. It's not the fall of a human. It's the path that a human took, the first human and his uh, mate, Adam and Kava or Eve, and they tried to be equal with God by grasping it, listening to the Nakash. Now, here he's telling about Adam 2. I kind of like Adam 1, Roman numeral Adam 2. So this is Adam 2, Jesus of Nazareth. He's also a flesh and blood man, born of a woman. He's born of a woman. Born of a woman in Hebrew, this is Galatians, of course, but it means a human being as opposed to an angelic being or some other kind of being. It's not the word incarnation. Jesus says, for example, among those born of women in the uh, Q source, you know, the gospel source, uh, the sayings that Matthew and Luke have in common, whether you call it Q or not, among those born of women, there's none greater than John. He doesn't talk about reincarnation. He's saying there's, there are two kinds of beings in the world. They're angelic beings that God created, and they're beings that are born of their atoms, in other words, A-D-A-M-S. They're of the Adamic uh, genus or race, right? Mm -hmm. So what did Adam II do? Adam II, his name was Yeshua or Yahshua, Yehoshua. He didn't do that. He didn't grasp equality with God. He did the opposite. He became a servant, a suffering servant even to the point of dying on the cross. Now notice it doesn't even say that he died for sins. I think Paul believed that he died for sins. But I just want you to notice the emphasis here is that he gave himself to the nth degree. It's the opposite of grasping. I want to be equal with God. He's totally unequal with God so, to the point that he's executed like a criminal. Talk so about rather than take, he gives. He Rather gives. than take, well, he doesn't like, just give; he just literally smashes himself into nothing. I'm just using what an it, analogy because the first Adam took is took, taking. Exactly. Okay? The right. second Adam, it seems, is giving. He's a he's giver. A he's not a taker. And what I find interesting, maybe you're going to do this already, is that verse six, who though he was in the form of God, well, Adam was an image in the image of God. That's right? where people get thrown off. I see what you're saying. Hey, the Genesis 126, let us make humans, right? After our likeness in our image. So though he's in the form of God, he has that potential to be God, to eat the tree of life. But he doesn't grasp and try to get it. 
he does the opposite. He, and, and it is giving, but it's more than giving. It's literally that word, he humbled himself. It's the idea of tapenos in Greek, just literally make yourself the lowest. Okay. And Paul loves this pattern. Remember, he, yeah. he says about himself that I am the least of the apostles, but I worked harder than them all. So anyway, <laughs> he struggles. So then, he struggles. Yeah. And then because he did this and notice even death on a cross, the most despicable, horrible, shameful way to die in the Roman world. Right. People die on their deathbeds. They die all kinds of ways. They die in accidents. But a cross in his day, you know, being crucified. So therefore, God has highly exalted him. Now, of course, if he's dead, it involves what's called resurrection. But here's a secret that I try to tell my students. Everybody calls 1 Corinthians 15 the resurrection chapter. They go, oh, that's the resurrection. He starts with Jesus' resurrection, and then he goes to all, all this, those in Christ will be raised and so forth. It's not the resurrection chapter. You know what I would call it? It's the transformation chapter. What do I mean by that? It's a Greek word, metamorphosis, to right. transform. It's to go from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Now, of course, you have to go into the cocoon and, quote, die. Or, one analogy, plant a seed and it dies. Go back to the dust as Jesus died as a flesh and blood human being. But then Paul talks about the dead and the living. That's why it's not just about resurrection. The only reason the dead are included in that chapter is because the Corinthians are thinking, oh, when Jesus comes back, we're all going to get this butterfly transformation. We're caterpillars. We're lowly flesh and blood people. And we're going to turn into monarch butterflies like Jesus was. Wow, this is so great. And somebody goes, well, what about those people that died like they missed, right? Because he's going to come and, oh, no, no, he'll raise them up first. And as, yeah, but as they come, they're raised incorruptible. He's not going and searching for body parts. The sea will give up the dead. Well, you know, that pretty well tells you that we're not looking for bones or ashes that get scattered or rotten corpses that deteriorate within a year or two. That's not his idea. But the essential self, he doesn't really call it a soul, but, you know, the idea of Sheol or Hades, it's a, it's a, I like the word a shadow or a shade. And his metaphor is sleeping, sleeping in the dust. So if you die, it's just like you unplug a computer and it's not running anymore. And then if it drops on the floor and breaks and, or you leave it out in the weather and it deteriorates, it's gone. But if it could get rebooted and transformed maybe in some new enhanced, this is just an analogy, but the idea, that's Paul's view of death. He talks about concerning those that have fallen asleep. Uh, what does he mean, fallen asleep? They're dead. They're gone. Dust you are, to dust you shall return. So they're going to come back. Then the question is, well, how are they going to come back? They're going to come back in a new body. So in the next chapter, he explains this. So you have to read Philippians 3 to understand this. This is Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Flip it over. Okay. But our commonwealth is in heaven, and he's contrasting that with people who set their minds on earthly things, and their God is their belly and so forth. And he says, our commonwealth is in heaven. Commonwealth is politia, our city our politics, our place we really belong. And notice, and he didn't say, and we'll go to heaven. He says, and from it, we await a savior, a soter, a rescuer. What's he going to rescue you from? Mortality, from dust. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will change, that's the same word, metamorpho, who will change our lowly body, the body of dust, to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So the idea would be here that Jesus is Adam too. And if you will, as an Adam, you and I are an Adam, A-D-A-M, 
not A T O M, yeah. we're but made of atoms. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we're flesh and blood, and we're going to go back to the dust. Or, as Paul believed, if you live to see the parousia, the coming, then you would have the opportunity in the moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, to be transformed, just like that. Blink of an eye. You will go from flesh to spirit. Now you're a spirit being. You're turned into the spirit being, the dead are transformed, raised in this glorious body. So that's his view of what we call resurrection. But I look right here when he says, who will change our uh, lowly body? He's not talking about dead people. He's talking about our lowly body, meaning what? We rot, we stink, our teeth decay, we get old, we age, we get sick. It's Buddhism. What did the Buddha see? I see a sick man. I see a dying man, right? I see death. I see suffering in the world. So he's going to change that. That's the idea here. So Philippians 2 is not about Jesus was the perfect eternal being in heaven, gave it all up and came to earth, died for your sins. And then he got to go back up and enjoy what he had before. I read Philippians 2 as an example of the firstborn, this is what Paul says, of many brothers and sisters. And I'm going to add sisters, even though it's not gendered. Many children of God. So in Romans 8, he says the cosmos itself. You want to turn to Romans oh, 8? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the cosmos itself is groaning for this cosmic transformation. He says not only we ourselves that are going to get transformed, but the cosmos itself. Now, what is it going to get transformed from? The cosmos, from its bondage to decay. You see the idea? Right. So we're in a decaying world, temporary, flesh and blood. There's one example of one of these atoms, A-D-A-M-S, that has gone through the process of humbling himself dying on the cross, and then being highly exalted. Uh, and that would be Jesus. So is what his impact from the uh, Greco-Roman world and their philosophy in this thinking that the cosmos is decaying and, and, and rotting and it needs redemption? Is this, yeah, this but is in more the than a right? world, you, you don't change the cosmos, you escape it. Ah, it. okay. It's okay. the sinking boat. It's the hopeless darkness. Di I call it diamonds in the mud. You're a diamond, your soul, and you're in the muck and the ship, basically. Yeah, I can say that word. Aren't and the Gnostics kind of thinking exactly. that way? Okay, yeah. okay. And so this is very different. Paul is coming from more of a Hebraic idea. Genesis says the world is good, but it's subject to, as he says here, it's subject to futility. Because God intended it. Think of it as a temporary mock-up version of these Adam creatures. But since they're flesh and blood, they can die. They don't have eternal life. So they can sin or they can do good. They can choose. They all. Everybody has their life story. It's sort of like the prototype of, of the future of what could be. Then he goes on to say that the creation itself is going to be set free from its bondage to decay. Mm. The creation itself. Verse and he 21 says, of and Romans not, 8, in case anyone's tracking. Right. And we ourselves groan inwardly for the redemption of our bodies. Why would he say that? Most Christians today would not care about the body. I need my body redeemed? No, I... I my body is corrupt. I, I need to leave and go to heaven. The earth is corrupt. You know, think of all the Christian hymns. This is a dark world. I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. Heaven is my home. You know, all this imagery of the wandering world, it's, it's all quasi-Hellenistic Gnostic with a small g, maybe. Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't have that view. He's coming from this Hebrew view where the creation is basically good gone bad. It's good gone bad full of sin and death, okay? Outside the gates of Eden, as Bob Dylan puts it, I love that song, outside the gates of Eden, a lot of stuff happens. 
like Cain whacks Abel in the head and kills him and <laughs> people begin to lie and people begin to live and create, you know, the human story. But notice what he says uh, as you go on reading that Jesus is the firstborn among many to come. So he's the first of these new Adams, Adam twos, but there's going to be a bunch of Adam twos. It's a family. Mm -hmm. Right now there's just one. And this is what drives Paul's theology. Of course he believes in justification by faith. Because only by grace and faith, you if you're a caterpillar, I don't care how good you are, change yourself into a butterfly. You know, what are you going to just sit there and go, I want to be a butterfly? It's not going to happen, right? It has to be done by a, a higher force, a metamorphosis in the cosmos. But he says he's the firstborn of many. And so Paul believes that he has seen the Lord. We talked a few weeks ago, and I made the kind of startling statement. Everybody says, you know, we don't have any eyewitness reports of the resurrection. Uh, well, we do have one if you accept the genuine letters of Paul. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I've seen the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, last of all, he appeared to me. I like the word sighting rather than you know, appeared. So, uh, you know, there were, Peter had a sighting, James had a sighting, the 12 had a sighting, the 500 had a sighting, and I finally had a sighting. Well, what is it that you had a sighting of? Right. A resuscitated corpse walking around Jerusalem? That would not be Philippians 2. Highly exalted him, transformed him into one of these new beings. Now, if you say, well, what would that look like? For Paul, it's as different as the caterpillar and the butterfly. I mean, they're really different looking. And if you'd never seen the butterfly, you'd have no idea what's going to come out of the cocoon. You see that? You'd right. think, you say, well, what, what is that little worm going to be? It looks like it's crawled into its grave and it's just kind of a, you know, sticky whatever. So, well, just watch. That's going to actually become something that will astound you. This is what Paul thinks. Now, what did Jesus become? A flesh and blood, breathing, sweating, stinking human being. Because he was, he was a human being, born of a woman, right? right? Just like John the Baptist, born of a woman, among those born of women. He became a divine, life-giving spirit. And then Paul says, because flesh and blood cannot inherit this kingdom, people read it piously like, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. What do, you, what do you mean? The kingdom is the cosmic rule over angels, principalities, powers. If you stay a mortal Adam one, which we all are right now, uh, you're gonna, you seriously think you're gonna rule the cosmos. Now, remember, we're talking about his view of the cosmos. Right. Levels of heaven, unbelievably powerful forces, just even in the air. Satan's the god of the world, the prince of the power of the air, heights, depths. He mentions right here in Romans 8, he says, principalities, powers, angels, things present, uh, and so forth. So, how are you? going to have the kingdom of God, not as a living, breathing creature of dust. So then he says in 1 Corinthians 15, the first Adam was a man of dust. Well, Jesus was a person of dust. He died. Jesus died. And people ask me what I believe about Jesus. This is more personal. They go, what do you believe about Jesus? I believe a lot of things historically. You know, like that he, I think he grew up in Nazareth and that he went to Sepphoris and, you know, all kinds of things. But I've often said, uh, dead, he's dead and not divine. Now, what I mean by not divine, I mean, I'm not trashing him or anything. It's like he's a flesh and blood human being. Now, I personally am not. A believing Christian. Usually I don't talk about my own faith because I want to do mm -hmm. I'm interested in what Paul taught and getting the idea straight, you see. Uh, but I am in the sandbox, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm very interested in what I think Paul thought. And I'll tell you what he thought because he tells us what he thought. 
He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So Jesus is flesh and blood. He dies. But he says, neither can corruption inherit incorruption. As you can't turn this body into what he's talking about. Back to the caterpillar and the butterfly. And, and just so everybody, I must poke, and I want you to yeah. know too, we're going to get your super chats. Don't worry. I promise you we are. I hope you've enjoyed this so far. Um, I'm writing an article now. In fact, Dr. Tabor is going to take a look at it and help me tweak some things because I am not a uh, scholar who's used to writing articles and stuff. So, But um, I'm using a lot of his work, and I want to use more of it in this issue. Paul contradicting Luke and John. And I want to get into this. What? So when Christians love going to 1 Corinthians 15, they love to make these arguments in their apologetics to prove the resurrection is true and Jesus rose and you need to believe or be damned and all this stuff. It's like when we want to pin down what did Paul mean? What did Paul see when he says I cited or the Lord appeared? Absolutely. Or, it Absolutely. is not what you think of in the Well, there's John. a professor at Liberty University. Let's don't name him. You know, we don't need to. Okay. who writes uh, pretty huge books, and I've met him, and we've talked, and we're friends on a, on a certain level. And he pins everything, as many apologists do, William Lane Craig, Eric, just about all of them, on Luke and John's accounts, and a little bit of Matthew, but Matthew's not their big one, because in Matthew, they're on a misty mountain, and some doubt, and they it may i'm not even sure what they saw but they heard a voice supposedly and so right, forth right right but but everything's been a, and yet if you say but are those eyewitness accounts i think it has to be admitted well luke says i didn't see this but i checked with eyewitnesses and they saw it right. and, you know okay so it's not eyewitness account luke didn't say whoever luke is the author he didn't the author did not say i saw it it's not one of the we passages, right, of right. the book of Acts. Okay, so where's an eyewitness account? Say, well, Matthew, well, you know, again, you've got to go at the academics. These names are put on later, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're talking about a resuscitated corpse for apologetic reasons. If you go back to Paul, Paul is our only first-person witness of the resurrection of Jesus, or could I say, of the transformation of Jesus, now that I've introduced that idea, right. of the Philippians 2 phenomena, of the highly exalted Jesus from dust to a life-giving spirit. Okay, he's the first witness. And what does he say? He likens his experience to the experience of the others. Well, I don't have anything from Peter first person or from James first person. We have a letter attributed to James. He doesn't even mention the resurrection. And he only mentions Jesus twice. And once is in the beginning, just kind of saying, oh, yeah, I'm writing about Jesus, you know, <laughs> faith in the Lord Jesus or something of that nature. So what did Paul really see? Well, you know what? We don't have to wonder what Paul really saw. And I'm not going to the book of Acts here. Oh, he saw a light. I think maybe he did see a light, but I, I'm talking about first person. He tells you what he saw, and you know what he says? I can't describe it. He had this glorious, incorruptible, new body, like a life-giving spirit. But if you say, well, but what kind of a body, a soma, like the shape? And he said, I can't really say, but I can say that we will also be like that. So, I mean, well, if is... we're going to be like that and he can't explain it, then he did not go around and eat fish right. and touch Jesus' wounds. That's not what he's saying. But what people do, including our dear professor at Liberty, and if he hears this, you know, I'll be glad to talk to him, get, him, get us together sometime. I, I don't want to it. debate, no, but no, I'd no, love no, to I talk. It. I get it. Because I actually like him very much. But anyway, uh, plenty of apologists told this view. They're more worried about, like, Jesus, he, okay, he's dead. He's put in a tomb. So he needs to come out of that tomb and walk around to show that he was resurrected. Right. Well, do you realize that wouldn't even show that he was resurrected? I don't see that in foot. I see 
God highly exalted him, meaning he made him ruler over the entire cosmos. That's not a corpse walking around. Yeah. You see the difference? And so Paul Paul is not interested in bodies. He's not interested in body parts. He's not interested in rotten corpses. He's not interested in people that die at sea and how are we going to get them back? Because he thinks Adam's told dust you are and to dust you return. Notice dust you are. Humans die, they go back to the dust. Now here, I know it's shocking to people. So what happened to Jesus' body? It went back to the dust. Uh, now, if, how would I know that? Because Paul tells you in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, you know what it's like? It's like you've got you. We're, we're at in 2 Corinthians 5? 2 Corinthians 5. He gives two analogies. He says, I'm going to give you two analogies of the coming transformation. One is, it's kind of like old clothing. Like you are you, you're naked, and you put on clothes. The body is your clothing. It's a Greek image. Plato uses it. You're clothed with your body. And it's kind of a nice analogy because I feel like I'm me. But if I lose my arm or lose a appendage of my body, I, I'm still me. So I'm, I'm clothed with the body. Body means your mode of existence in communicating to the world. So I'm able to talk to you with my voice, with my gestures. We can get on video. We can talk like this with our bodies, right? Right. But me is my spirit or my soul or myself, my inner self you know, my self-conscious identity. He says, it's like old clothes. And then he says, and you take off the old clothes. Well, now you're naked. You don't have a body. Right. But he said, that's not what we want. We want new clothes, further clothes. A whole new now, body. Here would be the analogy of worrying about the corpse. I got these old clothes. They're kind of tattered and rotten and stinky because I'm getting old, you know, old body mm -hmm. headed for the dust. So I shed the body, that's death. Now I'm naked, I don't have a body. I'm in the state of uh, death or sleep. It's the interim state as Paul understands it. And then I'm given this new glorious body, new clothing, it's glorious. I don't go, oh, this is so great, but I'm gonna always carry these old clothes around with me. Man, I love those old clothes. I'm gonna pick them up, I'll put them in a little suitcase and walk around. I know I'm being silly, but the point is, Paul doesn't care about Jesus's body. Now, someone said, but but he believes in the bodily resurrection. Uh, yes, if you understand that it's a life-giving spirit. It's a punematos body, a spirit body. That is the body. But he doesn't believe in taking dust or old clothing and transforming that into the new and that's then he, what, the other analogy is a house says so it's like a house You're that's what in i was gonna house. say second Corinthians five what it sounded to me like for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed we yep. have a building from god a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens that's uh, the new for in in this tent we groan longing to put on our heavenly dwelling if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked now you, this gets into that exact analogy you point out but my question is I wonder if Paul thinks there's like a um, – because they already have the pneuma of Christ, their body, their new body, is up in heaven right now waiting for them. Potentially. Yeah, it's – it's it's uh, in some of the apocryphal texts, it's garments. You know, it's okay. seen as white garments or something. These are just analogies. Paul doesn't tend to go into that as much. But, yeah, it's very similar. And right. so, again – Am I going to carry my tent, my old tent? I need that tent. I need to, you know, look, I can see your tent. You can see my tent. But once yeah. I die, who cares about the tent? The question is, is there something beyond death? And, an, and I don't mean like immortal soul or something. Is there an event later in history that is going to reclothe me, further clothe me, he says. Not that we'd be naked, but further clothe. Or permanent building uh and he thinks that jesus uh is the first who's experienced this transformation so i would say that paul is the first eyewitness to the resurrection but what he saw he says i can't tell you 
because it's so glorious and amazing and different from this world and this body mm -hmm. that I don't have words to express it. I think that's the things unutterable. Real quick, and then I want to get to these super chats. Putting on skeptical goggles, which you are all too well good at, and but you're also very respectful about people's faith. My channel, everyone knows where I stand. I don't believe these things ontologically are true. I think if Paul experienced something, I would say women who were super fans of Elvis, seeing Elvis after he died, you know, whatever it might be that they experienced, there's some psychological or whatever might be going on, something's happening here. But is it fair to think that Paul's experience was a bright light of some sort that he can't describe? We could psychoanalyze, we can, we can try to... Um, diagnose 2000 years ago, which we can't really do. My point is we can attempt and speculate and whatnot, but do you think this, what he can't describe is described in blinding bright? It could be. That's certainly in the book of Acts. That's how it's described, but that he didn't write that. Right. He does. Uh, I think voice is the key. He hears something mm -hmm. because he talks about that in his ascent to paradise, which is what this is about. He says, I asked the Lord Jesus this, and he said this to me. So it's it's what we would probably call clairvoyance of a voice, but uh, maybe initially it was like a light. I think rather than an Elvis sighting, it would be more like uh, Our Lady or Fatima or some of the right, uh, right. visions of Mary, where it's not exactly, you know, flesh and blood woman necessarily, but some sort of a glorious thing, but often with some sort of ability to communicate or something like that. I mean, he tells us all he can. I'm sure he would like to tell us more. And it's not like I, I just didn't mention, I actually saw him and he had arms and legs. And But if that's the case, then when they go, well, what kind of a body are you talking about? He would say, well, you know, I could give you a pretty good description because I ate some fish with him and he looked kind of like a normal human, but then he could walk through doors and stuff like that. But he didn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he didn't go there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to Mark and you go to Matthew, you're getting closer to that idea that it's more, I don't want to say resurrection is ascension, because that makes it sound like we're taking the corpse up to heaven. Right. Which would be like the Romulus thing or Luke 1 and Acts 1, flesh and blood human being begins to sail up and they dissolve and they And become, it wants to say he'll return in the same manner that he left and... Yeah, exactly. All, all of that. Well, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, Jesus eats in those accounts. What does he have? A stomach. And if he has a stomach, we could talk about other things that he would have. I mean, come on. You know, yeah. we're talking about organs. Is that it? Well, it might be it to Luke... And maybe John, at least in John 20, but it's certainly not Paul's idea because he says, I, I can't tell you what it's like, but it's, he, he says it's powerful, it's glorious, and it's immortal. Those are the three things he tells you. 